Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again. Tonight, we have our final lecture of Unit 1 for AP Human Geography. And we're going to be talking about our final theme of geography, and that is region. A region is an area on the Earth's surface that is marked by a degree of formal, functional, or perceptual homogeneity of some phenomenon. So let's start with our textbook definition of what a region is. An area distinguished by a unique combination of trends or features. In much the same way that a writer divides a book into chapters and then names or classifies them, geographers divide areas into regions that have some unique combination of features. These features may be a specific unifying characteristic. An example would be the Corn Belt. Where the unifying characteristic is corn. You guessed it. And that unifying characteristic could also be a pattern of activity. For example, there's a certain level of activity surrounding stores, and in particular, we'll use as our example, grocery stores. People will typically drive to their closest grocery store. So the level of activity is very strong in the area immediately surrounding the store. But as you get further from the store and you get closer to another store, the level of activity is less consistent and the boundary of that region is approaching. Speaking of the boundaries of regions, they're often dynamic and can shift. Boundaries may be tested and regions will often overlap depending on the characteristic or activity that's taking place. Now, there's three types of regions that we need to be familiar with. They are formal, functional, and vernacular. Let's look at each one of those in detail. A formal region is a type of region marked by a certain degree of homogeneity in one or more phenomena. It's also called a uniform region or a homogeneous region. And make sure that you're familiar with those alternative names because they're often used interchangeably and we don't know which one's going to be thrown our way. Formal regions share at least one trait, whether that is physical or human. And there's something in common within the boundaries of that region. The political boundaries established between countries and internal divisions within countries are formal regions. Boundaries are established and therefore there is uniformity within that boundary. For example, with national identities or citizenship. On the physical side, karst is an area that is made up of limestone. This is the stone forest found in China. And in the South China Karst region, which is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site, these landforms can be clearly distinguished from the surrounding areas, these huge outcroppings of limestone. But this image helps us to understand a common misconception about formal regions. Just because there is a degree of uniformity, of homogeneity, doesn't mean that it needs to be 100% homogeneous. Look at our karst picture. Is every square inch of that land covered in limestone? No. But there is a high degree of these karst formations in this area, which sets it apart from areas that surround it. A functional region is an area organized around a node or focal point. 
defined by the particular set of activities or interactions that occur within it. It's also known as a nodal region. Again, notice that it also goes by nodal region. A node is a central point where the functions are coordinated and directed around it. And since it's organized around a focal point or node, what do you think is the most ideal shape for a functional region? If you set a circle, you'd be right. But how often do you think that happens in reality? Not often. So an example of a node or a center point around which activity operates is a city. A city has a surrounding region within which workers will commute either to the downtown area or to office parks in the suburbs. That entire urban area, defined by people moving toward and within it, is a functional region. What we see here is called the Denver Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA. This is the city of Denver as the node, and the surrounding counties that are functionally tied to it meaning that people will live out in the suburbs in a neighboring county but may commute into work in downtown Denver. Denver is the node and everything around it that functions as a part of it, that's within its functional region. A vernacular region is an area that people believe exists as part of their cultural identity and not as a physically demarcated entity. It's also known as a perceptual region. And honestly, it goes by perceptual region probably more often than it's referred to as a vernacular region. Perceptual regions can include people and their cultural traits, things like dress, food, language, or religion, places and their physical traits, mountains, plains, or coasts, and built environments, windmills or barns, skyscrapers or beach houses. And probably the best and most common example of a perceptual region is the American South. What I always like to do with perceptual regions is have my students close their eyes and picture the South. So go ahead and do that. Close your eyes, get a map in your mind of what the South is. Do you have it? Now, do you think we all have the same picture in our mind? Probably not. And the key with perceptual regions is that they are perceived to exist by inhabitants through widespread acceptance, which means that sharp borders don't typically exist with vernacular regions. In fact, it's in that definition. It's not a physically demarcated entity. And when borders are less sharp, you may notice that as you move away from the core of that region, the characteristic that you help to define that region begins to weaken until it disappears. And this is known as the core domain sphere phenomenon. And we'll talk about it again later this year. But there are some regions where cultural identity has led to groups of people identifying with one region more than another. Let's look at Quebec. A strong cultural identity toward the French language in Quebec has led certain Canadian citizens to identify more with their sub-national identities, identifying as Quebecois more than Canadian. In fact, this strong attachment to this region led to an independence referendum and an attempt to break away from Canada. But if we change the scale, we can see that not everyone in Quebec supported that movement. The southern parts of Quebec, where the city of Quebec and Montreal are located, have a far higher percentage of people who speak French, and thus would have been more likely to support independence. The northern parts may not have felt the same compulsion for independence that the south felt. 
Ultimately, the independence referendum was unsuccessful, but in an attempt to maintain a united Canada, the Canadian government recognizes two official languages, French and English. But before we go, what type of map is that? And what scale? Yeah, it's a choropleth map in the subnational scale. They're called provinces and territories in Canada. These are perceptual regions of the United States. So let's paint a word picture using this map. Let's imagine that you drive southward from, say, Pittsburgh or Detroit. You're not going to pass a specific place where you enter the South but you'll begin to note certain things in the cultural landscape that you perceive to be associated with the South, like an increase in the number of Waffle House restaurants. On a side note, what type of map is that? Dot distribution, good. And at some point of this trip, these features are begin going to begin to dominate the landscape to such a degree that you're gonna say, now I'm really in the South. And this can be because of a variety of things, a variety of features that you see on the landscape. It could be the style of houses and their porches. It could be items on a roadside menu like grits or soul food. A local radio station's music, perhaps more country or gospel music. It could be the sound of accents that you perceive to be Southern, including things like y'all. Or it is a succession of Baptist churches along the way. But these things combine to give us an impression that is part of the overall perception of the South as a whole. In fact, and this is one of my favorite stories, I have a friend who lives in Oklahoma. And we were having lunch one day, and she said that Oklahoma is definitely part of the South. I was intrigued, because that wasn't going to be my guess. And if you look at the map, Oklahoma kind of has a split personality. So I asked her, why do you think or consider yourself Southern? She didn't miss a beat. She said, because I drink sweet tea. I wasn't really sure how to take that. But then, a couple years later, I was talking to another AP Human Geography teacher from Louisiana. And I told her that story. And she just started laughing. She said, Oklahoma is not part of the South. You can forget your sweet tea. But here's the thing. Perceptual regions are part of a person's cultural identity. So it's really difficult to draw sharp lines, unless apparently it's over sweet tea. All right, now let's have some fun. We're going to take a little quiz. Don't worry. All you have to do to pass is jot down your guesses in your notes and bring them to class. So it's a fun quiz, or as I like to call them, fizz. It's a fun quiz. It's a fizz. I know it's a bad joke, but I like it. Here we go. First off, let's ask, what type of map is this? And at what scale are we analyzing this? Then, what type of region is the Midwest? Is it formal, functional, or perceptual? Put your guess in your notes. Next up, what type of region is the state of Nevada. Formal, functional, perceptual. What type of region would a milk shed be? Now, first off, this isn't a literal shed full of milk, but rather the distance from a distribution center that a dairy will deliver fresh milk. Beyond the boundaries of this, they may not deliver fresh milk, but rather deliver more evaporated milk or uh, processed dairy products like cheese or butter. But notice 
how the outer limits are affected by truck routes, probably the highway system. This gets into how connected and accessible a place is, and in this case, whether or not they get fresh milk. So what type of region would this be? The Sahara Desert, what type of region would this be? Formal, functional, perceptual. How about the range of a radio station and their radio signals? Formal, functional, perceptual. Hey, what type of map is this? And at what scale is the data aggregated? And then finally, what type of region would this be? French language around the world, okay, either as an official language or widely spoken. This is a mental map. A mental map is exactly what you think it might be, a map that you have in your mind. So what kind of region would that be? Formal, functional, perceptual. The U.S. wheat belt is the area where most wheat is grown here in the United States. So what type of region would that be? Next one, let's start with just what a watershed is. A watershed is a region in which all rainfall eventually flows downhill through a system of streams and tributaries into the same body of water. So, what type of region would that be? How about the Middle East? What kind of region would this be? Formal, functional, perceptual. What do you think? And for our last quiz question, let's ask a few questions. We're going to spend a little bit more time on this. Let's start with what type of map is this going to be? And we're going to answer it right now. It's a choropleth map looking at election results in 2016 sorted into two classes. And at what scale are we looking at? It is the subnational or state scale referring to US states, our subnational units. The data is grouped at the state level. So now, what type of region would this be? Formal, functional, vernacular. We're going to answer that one right now. It's a formal region. How do we do? And it's formal because there is a certain degree of homogeneity within these states. Blue states supported the Democrat and red states supported the Republican. And this is a common color scheme used when discussing politics. Red is often associated with conservative ideology, which is often represented by the Republican Party. And blue is often associated with a liberal ideology, which then is often represented by the Democratic Party. But that can get a little too simplistic. So let's look at Nevada, for example. Nevada is blue, meaning that the Democrat in 2016, Secretary Clinton, won Nevada's six electoral votes. But does that mean that everyone in Nevada voted for Clinton? Of course not. Remember, it doesn't have to be 100% uniformity for it to be a formal region. So just like we talked about before, Let's change the scale to see how the story of the 2016 election changes. Now, this is still a core pleth map, but the scale of analysis is now at the county scale. Let's look at Nevada again. This map allows us to look at the 16 counties in Nevada and see that only two of them went blue, Clark and Washoe County. But Clinton won the state anyway. How is that? Well, a three-dimensional map would show us that Clark and Washoe counties have larger populations, which makes sense because those two counties have Las Vegas, Henderson, North Las Vegas, and Reno, the four biggest cities in the state. 
So even though they are the only two counties that were won by Clinton, it was enough to carry the entire state. Now, you might notice that this three-dimensional map is not just red and blue, but also contains shades of purple. And that is because very few areas have such strong homogeneity. Many political geographers will use a purple map to show the level of variation within the country. So the brighter blue and brighter red areas are more homogeneous, while the areas that are more purple show the gap between liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, are not as wide as you may think. To finish up tonight, we should be aware of some of the regions that the College Board has established and will often use for AP Human Geography. You're probably already familiar with most of these, but go ahead, pause the video, take a minute, and just read through the big picture view of the regions of the world. Now, there are a couple of things to know. Notice that Central America is part of the North American continent, but its culture has been influenced more by Spain and Portugal than by Great Britain and France. So they differentiated on this map. Notice also that Sub-Saharan Africa is distinguished from the rest of Africa, North Africa. And the Russian Federation spans both the European and Asian continents. Now, we finish up by taking an even closer look at the world regions and human geography. So again, go ahead, pause the video, read through these regions. But this time, I want you to jot down some observations, some questions, some thoughts that you have about this map. And I want you to bring those to class so we can discuss them. And that's where we'll end tonight. Unit 1 is now officially done, and we can start getting ready to get into the really interesting material now. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you back in class.